You know, thanks be to God, this uh, past Monday, I celebrated yet another birthday. And, you know, I'm getting to that point where, you know, you just, you don't really broadcast exactly how old you are, you know. I'm not embarrassed or anything. <laughs> I may have quite a few gray hairs if you look closely. But I think that's just wisdom, you know, that's, that's how I take it. There, yeah, see, I'm trying to get on your level. That's, that's wisdom right there. <laughs> and truth be told, you know, I'm just a little older than Jesus was during his earthly ministry. I'm not embarrassed. I just don't think it's necessary to, to keep count of my years as much as I once did. Because, you know, there's really only two birthdays that count. It's a blessing to have a first birthday to be born from our mother's womb. But as Reverend Cook reminded us recently in morning prayer, we all need to have a second birthday. It's great to be born, but it's greater to be born again. I thank God for another revolution around the sun, the S-U-N. And may every day revolve around the sun, the S-O-N. As I said before, right from birth I was scorned within, adorned with sin, but I'm glad I'm born again. My relationship with God used to be worn and thin, but I'm sworn to him their son what a storm had been. Inform your kin about his amazing grace. With my poetic praise, I try to raise the place. Fire shut up in my bones at a blazing pace and weeding out of this world like rays in space. They made the case for Christ and delivered the verdict. He bled, hung and died. Everyone in town heard it. Hours of pain. But they were not hours in vain because of his sacrifice, his mercy is hours to gain. He was resurrected. He rose on the third day. My heavenly home's erected. This is what the words say. In the worst way his message you could use, I'm alive in Christ and I'm telling the good news. My brothers and sisters, the good news is that by being faithful to Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we can be born again and enjoy eternal life in the kingdom of God. I think everyone who wished me a happy birthday and I wish we all may have a holy birthday. In our text today, John 3, 1 to 8, Jesus is going to talk about the necessity of a holy birthday. In context, at this point in John, Jesus is in Jerusalem around the time of the Passover. A few verses earlier, John 2, 23 says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. John 2.23. You see, in John, Christ's miracles are called signs. For Christ's miracles signified that he was the Savior. That Christ the King was ushering in the kingdom of God. The first sign, of course, was turning water into wine which pointed to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about there being new wine at the consummation of the kingdom. Continuing John 2, 24 to 25, it says, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. John 2, 24 to 25. You see, Christ knew that those who followed him because of his miracles were not following for all the right reasons. Many follow him for signs, but they need to follow him for salvation. And the Savior knows the true inner character of every person, of every man. And notice the segue in John 3.1. John 3.1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, John 3.1. So given the segue, it seems wise to expect that Jesus, who knows the inner character of every man, 
is going to address the inner character of this man, Nicodemus. And who was this character? Well, Nicodemus, as a leader of the Jews, was likely a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest ruling council of the Jews back in that day. The Sanhedrin consisted of 70 members, 70 members. And this ruling council was led by the high priest. Among the Jews, Nicodemus was likely a man of great importance, a highly educated teacher of the law. Rabbis like him would serve as spiritual guides for the Jewish people and teach the law in the synagogues. Yet Christ came to fulfill the law, to bring it to its full significance, to bring about the deeper reality to which the law pointed. Christ came to fulfill Jewish institutions, metaphorically replacing the water of Judaism with the new wine of Christianity. And even though Nicodemus is a prominent man in Judaism, he needs a radical change of heart to follow the fullness of Jesus. He and Christ will converse about conversion. In verse 2, John 3, 2, this man came to him at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. John 3, 2. Now, many, now people have suggested many reasons as to why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. A lot has been written about Nick at night. See, I said they would laugh at that, honey. I told you. Were... But no reason is given in the text, so it's all speculation. That said, Nicodemus, he, he may have come under the cover of darkness to avoid being seen or for privacy. In the previous chapter, you know, Christ, he caused a little bit of, of controversy at the temple. You might re remember that he cleared out the temple, turned over some tables, ruffled some feathers. So maybe Nick at night doesn't want to meet with Jesus publicly and therefore be seen as his running mate. You know? Maybe Nick doesn't want to damage his own respected reputation and get thrown out of the synagogue and lose his prestigious position. But furthermore, throughout John, there's an interesting theme of light versus darkness. Light versus darkness. In John, darkness often refers to evil, error, and unbelief. In contrast, Jesus is the true light that gives light to everyone. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. But people love their dark deeds more than the Lord's light. You know, after this episode in John 3, 18 to 21, we read about Jesus. It says in verse 18 of chapter 3, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John 3, 18 to 21. Do you know what time of day when most serious crimes occur? At night. And I bet that whoever stole the catalytic converter from the church van You notice we, we moved it so it's close to the cameras. The church van is right in the center of the parking lot now, right? I bet whoever did it, they did the deed at night. People love to do their dark deeds when there's no light. You know, as a former DJ, a secular people pleaser, I know the effects that light can have on a party. 
oh, y'all must know what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're going to get to that later. <laughs> you see, people, they might act one way when the lights are on, but it's a different story when the lights are out. <laughs> People's true nature comes out when the lights go out. They do things they really want to do, but just don't want to be seen doing. But let someone hit that light switch, and their behavior might switch. You ever been in a dark room, and then all of a sudden someone flicks the light? It's not too comfortable, is it? It's like, oh, man, I'll turn on the lights. And when you try to reflect the light of Christ into someone's life, Often it's not too comfortable. Hey, hey, stop all that. People hate the light. Now, if you're doing something right, there's no need to hide from the light. In fact, we know that when people do something good, they often don't mind light. They love the limelight. People love to be seen doing good things. We love to be seen protesting for a good cause, marching for a good law. If it's against something we think is wrong, we'll speak out in the light. But as has been said in the song, freaks come out at night. Can I say that? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I said I used to be a DJ, right? I'm sorry. It just comes out sometimes. And in John 13, 30, come on, focus, y'all. And in John 13, 30, we read about the only other character in this gospel who comes out at night. It says, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. So maybe the fact that Nicodemus comes out at night, indicates that spiritually, he's still walking in the dark. But in any case, whether Nick coming at night is symbolic or not, by Jesus, he's about to be enlightened. Now, Nicodemus speaks not only for himself, but for others. Even though Christ doesn't have lofty academic credentials, Nicodemus says, we know, we know, that you are a godsend. Now, the we could refer to some of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee. But like refers to the many people who were mentioned back in John 2, 23. The many people who had seen the Savior's signs and believed in him on the basis of those signs. In other words, Nicodemus saw the signs and it opened up his eyes. He saw the signs. And now he seeks deeper understanding about to what the signs pointed. Many follow Christ for signs, but they need to follow Christ for salvation. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. Now the master's miracles provided divine authentication for the master's message. But a lot of people focus more on Christ's physical healing and blessings than his spiritual healing and blessings. Many times when we pray for blessings, we focus on health more than holiness. We want secular promotions more than spiritual promotions. We want a breakthrough that will break the bank. We want things that will make us feel better more than things that will help us follow better. But notice, Jesus, he doesn't focus on his miracles. Nicodemus needs to get the message. Nick acknowledges that Jesus has divine credentials. Cool. But Jesus isn't overly concerned about the approval of man. He focuses on this man's relationship with God. You know, a lot of people believe Jesus taught some great things. A lot of people think Jesus did some great things. But will they follow Christ's teachings 
and allow him to do a great thing in their life. Nicodemus is like, Jesus, you know, you're doing great things, man. You're doing great things. You're amazing, Jesus. No one can do these things. No one can do such things unless they were from God. You're amazing, Jesus. Amazing. And Jesus is like, "Uh Mm uh-huh. Sounds great. But let me tell you what no one can do. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born of the king. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying and everything, Nicodemus. But you know you have to be born again, right? We could talk about that all in a little long day, but you know you got to be born again. Brothers and sisters, we can sing all the praises to the Lord we want. But it's not about our godly compliments, but our godly commitment. People praise God when they win, but have they surrendered to the Savior? People praise for a raise, yet still stray in their ways. We can praise God for a new car, but do we let Jesus take the wheel? We can praise God for a degree, but the only BA that really matters is being born again. The Lord wants more than compliments. He wants commitment. He wants more than good remarks. He wants a good relationship. Now, in this chapter, Nicodemus addresses Jesus three times, verse 2, 4, and eventually verse 9. After each time, Christ replies with the same phrase, amen, amen, I say to you. Amen means truly. Before expounding upon a deeper spiritual truth. You know, in the Gospels, over and over again, people talk to Jesus on one level, and Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. People come with earthly questions and comments. Christ replies with heavenly counters and concepts. While they're concerned about the physical, he's more concerned about the spiritual. For example, in John 4, his disciples are like, Jesus, you hungry? You want some food? And in John 4, 34, Jesus says to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 4, 34. Now, could you imagine being one of his disciples? Coming back from the store with a bucket of chicken? Offering some food, and he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. You might be like, okay, so do you want some wings or should I wrap this up for you? I don't really know. Help me out, Jesus. <laughs> we can imagine their confusion. Disciples are thinking on a physical level. Jesus is talking on a spiritual level. Also earlier, earlier than that, In John 4, 9 through 10, when Jesus is talking with the Samaritan woman at the well, and he asked her for a drink of water, it says, in verse 9 of chapter 4, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water. After she responds in verse 13 and 14, Christ goes deeper. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's some living water right there. And later in John 7, 37 to 39, during the festival of tabernacles in Jerusalem, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet 
been glorified. John 7, 37 to 39. So Jesus, he's not just talking about physical water at the well. But the spiritual waters of the spirit that well up into eternal life. And we'll see how the Holy Spirit is associated with water in this passage as well. Now the word translated born more generally means to beget or become the parent of. It can refer to being born to a mother or to being begotten by a father. Being born to a mother or begotten to a father. You know, nowadays birth is generally more associated with a mother. But conception requires the seed of a father. And in scripture, this word often entails more of a fatherly role. Of a fatherly role. For example, in 1 John 3, 9, it says, No one who is born, same word, of God, will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born, same word, of God. You see, in this context, a child was thought to inherit the character traits of their father. And those who are supernaturally born of God the Father should exemplify the nature of God the Father. If they have the Father's seed, they should follow the Father's lead. Kids look like their fathers. This is what they tell me. I don't really see it sometimes. I think I'm more like mom. <laughs> but kids look like their fathers. And if a person's life is not godly, they're likely not a child of God. You see, a true child of God should bear the family resemblance. We should be chips off the old block. In our lives, we should consistently bear faithful fruit. And we apples shouldn't fall far from the tree. And if we are to exemplify the nature of God our Father, we must die to our old nature of sin and be faithful to Christ. As you read earlier in John 1, 10 to 13 about Jesus, it says he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed, i.e. those who are faithful to his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born... Same word, of God. John 1, 10 to 13. So let's not misunderstand the imagery as Nicodemus will do. Being born from above, being born again, is not made possible by a heavenly uterus, but by God sending the Spirit from heaven saying, I'll send you to us. Being born again is not about being delivered through a divine womb, but being delivered through the divine word the gospel of Jesus Christ. That said, though we are very familiar with the phrase born again, the text more literally says born from above. Born from above. As we've seen in John, Jesus and his listeners can be thinking on different levels. His words often cause confusion because they have multiple meanings. And apparently the word Jesus uses can mean both again and from above. There's no equivalent English word that has the same ambiguity. So if you look, many translations have in their footnotes from above. Now later in John 3, John the Baptist testifies about Jesus, who is much greater than he. And when some of his disciples were arguing, John the Baptist says in verse 28 of chapter 3, You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Verse 31, the one who comes from above, the same word, is above all. And the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. So later in this very same chapter, the same word translated from above 
is used to mean from heaven. And in James 1.17, Christ's half-brother writes, every good and perfect gift is from above. Same word. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Later, James says in James 3.15 that worldly wisdom does not come down from above. It does not come down from heaven. So being born again or being born from above refers to being born of God. And Christ says that those who are not born from above, born of the king's spirit, cannot see the kingdom. And by see, Christ likely means experience. Experience. Those who are not born from above will have no share in the kingdom of God. And we see this experiential meaning of see later in John 3, verse 36, which says, Whoever believes in or is faithful to the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. They will not see or experience life. Later in John 8, 51, Jesus says, Very truly, amen, amen, I say to you, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. John 8, 51. So those who reject the Son will not see or experience death eternal life. And those who obey the Savior's words will not see or experience spiritual death. And those who are not born from above will not see or experience the kingdom. Now, as you may recall, the kingdom of God is not really about a certain godly realm, but a certain godly rule. And though in a sense, the Lord reigns now, the Old Testament prophets They foretold of a time when the reign of God will be fully consummated at the end of the age. This reign will be ushered in by the prophesied servant of the Lord, the messianic king from the line of David. And this kingdom of God, God's kingly rule, was inaugurated by Christ the king's first coming and will be consummated by Christ the king's second coming. Now back then it was not expected that everyone would see or experience this reign or kingdom of God. But it was thought that all law-abiding Jews would certainly be included in the kingdom of God. Surely Nicodemus thought that he was safe. But Jesus corrects such presumptions. To see the kingdom of God, to have eternal life, even a revered rabbi like Nicodemus must be born again. Born from above. But Nick at night, he doesn't understand this. In verse 4, Nicodemus says to him, How can a man be born when he is an old man? He can't go into his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? Now, back in the day, a Gentile who converted to Judaism was said to be starting a new life, like a newborn child. So maybe Nicodemus should have gotten the point more quickly. But Nicodemus, like many others, misunderstands the words of Jesus. Nicodemus is asking about being physically born again. Christ is talking about being spiritually born from above. Born of God. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of of God. John 3, 5. There's been many theories about what Jesus means by being born of water and spirit. Some say born of water refers to natural birth, while being born of the spirit refers to spiritual birth. In this case, water would refer to a father's seed or the amniotic fluid in the mother's womb. Some say the water refers to the water of baptism, like the baptism of John the Baptist, or Jewish purification rites, or even Christian baptism. That said, again, when a Gentile convert converted to Judaism, they were likened to a newborn child. And their conversion included immersion. They were baptized in water to, in a way, remove their Gentile impurity. So Jesus telling Nicodemus that a person had to be born of water 
could have clarified that he's talking about conversion, about new birth. But it's even deeper than that. You see, after Jesus finishes his point, it says in verse 9 and 10, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? So it seems that Jesus expects Nicodemus to understand. Jesus is like, Nick, you're a teacher. More literally, it says in the Greek, you're the teacher. You're the man. You're the great Nicodemus. You teach the scriptures to the people. You lead service in a synagogue. How do you not know about being born from above? About being born of water and the spirit? Now this phrase being born of water and the spirit can actually be translated as water that is the spirit. Grammatically, the two terms water and spirit refer to a singular concept. And in the Old Testament, prophets like Joel and Isaiah, they foretold of the time when the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out on the Lord's people like water. And we also see the singular concept of water and spirit in a very important prophecy from Ezekiel. A prophecy that a great teacher like Nicodemus should already know. In Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, the Lord tells his people through the prophet, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So Ezekiel has already prophesied about the time when the Lord would put his spirit in his people, giving them a new heart. Like water, the spirit cleanses us from that which is impure in God's sight. Spiritually, this refers to an extreme transformation, a complete conversion, a radical regeneration. This refers to new life lived in accordance with God's guidelines being born again. New Jewish converts were baptized in water. True Christian converts are baptized by the waters of the Spirit, the living water of the Holy Spirit that wells up into eternal life. Being born again, being born from above, being born of water and the Spirit, they all refer to the same thing, spiritual regeneration, new birth from the Holy Spirit, a holy birthday. In verse 6, Jesus says, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. In other words, a physical father on earth brings about physical birth, and our spiritual father in heaven brings about spiritual birth. We've all had a physical birthday, yet we all need a spiritual birthday. In verse 7, Jesus says, You should not be amazed that I said you must be born again. John 3, 7. Now, as you likely know in, in English, the pronoun you can be singular or plural. If I said, hey, it's good to see you, you could be referring to a single person or several people in that whole section. So if I looked over here and said, hey, it's good to see you, it might not be clear if I was talking to one person or to everyone, to all of you in this section, to you all. Now, if you have roots in the South, you don't say you all. What do you say? Y'all. Y'all is a second person plural pronoun for you grammar. <laughs> Well, Greek has an official second person plural pronoun. That's not slang. And Jesus basically tells Nick at night, you, singular, shouldn't be surprised that I said you all, y'all, must be born again, born from above. Nicodemus said, we know, we know that you're a teacher from God. Jesus says, great, but y'all 
must be born again. And again, Nicodemus, he may have been surprised that an esteemed Jewish teacher like himself needed to be born again. That he required the new birth of spiritual regeneration. But whether you have high social status like Nicodemus or low social status like the Samaritan woman at the well, you must be born again. Y'all must be born again, says the Lord. Doesn't matter if you're in the White House or the Trap House. Jesus must make his home in your heart. Doesn't matter if you're from the north or the south. You need God to remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. Doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. You need the power of the Redeemer. Verse 8, our last verse for today. Verse 8, Jesus says, The wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but do not know from where it is coming nor where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, as you said many times, many words in John have multiple meanings. And Jesus is engaging in some interesting wordplay here that's hard to convey in English translation. You see, in Hebrew and Greek, wind and spirit are actually the same word. So sound of the wind can also mean voice of the Spirit. And whereas the Spirit is associated with water in Ezekiel 36, the Spirit is associated with wind and breath in Ezekiel 37. The Spirit gives life to the dead, dry bones of Israel. We won't get into that today, but a rabbi like Nicodemus, he should know this context. He should catch Jesus' allusions. And like the wind, the Spirit has mysterious movements, which cannot be harnessed by human hands or religious institutions. And like the wind, the origin and destination of those born of the Spirit is a mystery to those who do not have the Spirit. Unbeknownst to the world, those of us who have been born from above will have eternal life with the Lord from above. And like the wind, the Spirit himself cannot be seen, but one can see the Spirit's effects. Brothers and sisters, if the Spirit of God blows into a person's life, there's going to be some change. A ship can't stay on the same course when there's a holy headwind. We can't play the same old games when there's a godly gust. Habits of sin are broken by the Holy Spirit's breeze. Now, though Nick at night comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness, apparently he eventually sees the light. In fact, Nicodemus later defends Jesus at a meeting of the Sanhedrin, John 7.50, and he actually helps prepare the, Jesus' body for burial with Joseph of Arimathea in John 19.39. In Christ's conversion conversation with Nick at night, it serves as a model for all who need to come into the light, into the light of Jesus, the light of the world, the light that many people hate, but it's really a light of love. And it doesn't matter if you follow religious rules like Nicodemus, you must be born again. It doesn't matter if you teach righteous behavior like Nicodemus, you must be born again. It doesn't matter if you have high social status or a prominent position like Nicodemus, y'all must be born again, says the Lord. In order to see or enter or experience the kingdom of God, in order to have eternal life, we must be born again born from above. You know, it's funny how people think that we can fix this broken, fallen world with secular solutions. Maybe if we all just looked a little deeper inside ourselves and peel back the layers of corruption caused by an unjust civilization, things will be better. Or maybe if people got more outside help from governments or nonprofits, things would be better. My brothers and sisters, broken people can't fix a broken world.
Ultimately, human policy, human currency, human strategy can't fix the human heart. We shouldn't look inwards. We shouldn't look outwards. We need to look upwards. We're so broken, we can't be rebuilt through human hands. We need to be reborn through the master's plans. The first step is admitting that we can't fix ourselves. We need to be born from above. Spiritual regeneration. It's great to be born. It's greater to be born again. I thank God for another revolution around the sun. But may every day revolve around the sun. I receive a lot of great birthday presents in life. But none greater than the presence of the spirit who gives life. And new birth. And I wish y'all many happy birthdays. But I wish we may all have a very holy birthday. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a holy birthday.